in JSP 2.2, it's a lot, lot shorter. And essentially, it comes down to these three new configuration settings. And there is, these are all settings you can use in web.xml to set defaults for JSP pages. So you can set the default content type. So here in this example, we're setting it to text HTML. You can set the default buffer size. Here we're setting it to 4K. And it also introduces a new property, this error on undeclared namespace, which you can then default to true. That last one is actually quite useful. Prior to JSP 2.2, if you used a tag in a JSP page that you hadn't declared, it would just get silently ignored. So if you made a typo in, um, say, the library name, that wouldn't necessarily get picked up unless you noticed that whatever you're expecting the tag to provide wasn't there. If you turn on error on undeclared namespace, then what will happen is that if you have a tag, or you, sorry, if you try and use a tag in a JSP page that isn't declared, then that will actually throw a compilation exception, and you'll see that error straight away. So it makes it more, it makes that particular class of error more obvious and therefore easier to debug. That, that's pretty much it for um, the JSP. There are a few uh, clarifications. But I don't think they change, well, in fact, I know they don't change the way that uh, Tomcat behaves in terms of JSP pages because Tomcat had already um, implemented the behavior those clarifications required. So moving on to the expression language, here there aren't too many changes. There are some at the low level. The expression language is now pluggable, so you can provide your own implementation of the expression language if you so wish. But in terms of a sort of things a direct user will see, then really the only change is the support for method invocations. Now, there were ways of fudging this with prior versions of the expression language, but in EL 2.2, you can actually um, invoke methods directly. So in this little example JSP we've got here, we've created a couple of beans, and we've set a property on each of those beans, and then we've put those beans in the page context. What we then do in our tags, and that echo tag, by the way, just echoes the, uh, the output to the, uh, to the JSP page, is we access those beans and call methods on bean B in various different ways. So in the first one, we get the bean property of bean A, which is an instance of bean B, and then we call the say hello method on, on that instance of bean B. On two, we do exactly the same thing, but we just do it in a different way. Uh, sorry, that was one. And then in two, we do uh, call the method directly on bean B rather than going via bean A. So just to see sort of how the different uh, ways are available to call the methods via expression language. It's worth mentioning that later versions of Tomcat 6 have tightened up the implementation of expression language. There were a number of places that weren't quite specification compliant, and they're all error conditions and edge cases. So it's things like the wrong type of exception being thrown and the like. So you shouldn't notice um, any functional change to your applications. You might just notice some changes. Uh, if you get something wrong, you might start to see some slightly different exceptions. There were some actual changes in behavior in a few places, but it's fairly unlikely you're going to hit across one of those. I think we've seen so far just one user come up come up against issues with um, enums and coercing them to different types, which they were doing something that you, wasn't technically valid, that, but Tomcat let you do, but now it won't. So that's um, the specification changes. Let's go on to look at some of the other changes that are in Tomcat 7. First of all, and probably one of the biggest changes is the memory leak protection. This is sufficiently useful that we've, we've backported it to Tomcat 6, and there are two aspects to this. There's the prevention for JVM context class loader based memory leaks, and that's all implemented in the GRE memory leak prevention listener that's now configured in server.xml. And the purpose of that listener is to work around a number of known issues in the JVM 
that can cause memory leaks somewhat unexpectedly if you happen to use particular parts of the Java API. So that listener will provide you some protection against that. Additionally, in the web application class loader, when the web application stops, we've added a number of checks for memory leaks within the application. And where we can, we'll actually fix those memory leaks. So to give you some examples, um, if a JDBC driver is registered but not deregistered, that can trigger a memory leak, so we'll fix that. If an application is setting a thread local and not clearing it, then we will flag that up and optionally you can clear it. It's, that fix is optional because it's not um, strictly thread safe the way we have to do that. Uh, so because of the thread safety issues, it's disabled by default. I should point out that we do see a lot of applications misusing thread locals. The only safe way to use a thread local within an application is you must create and remove it within a single re request response pair. So you can't create a thread local in one request and then um, leave it there and then access it in a subsequent request. If you do that, then you are guaranteed to see a memory leak. Uh, next issue related to thread locals, but threads themselves. Applications that start threads also need to stop the threads. Um, there's no way that Tomcat can safely stop them, so it doesn't try. If you really want it to force it to, then there is an option that will allow you to, tr to try stopping the threads, but I would caution you that it's been shown itself to be very unstable. In my experience, about 50% of the times I try using that feature, it actually crashes the entire JVM. So it's not something that you'd normally want to use. And finally, there are some issues around resource bundles and RMI that as an application developer, you can't actually do anything about. Um, so Tomcat will just fix those for you. I should also point out that where you see, or where Tomcat reports an application memory leak, it includes memory leaks in third-party libraries. So it might not be something that the, you as a web application developer have done wrong explicitly. It might be a bug in one of the libraries you're using. The memory leak detection feature has already been proved very useful to identify those sorts of bugs. And so far, we've fixed bugs in uh, log for j we fixed bugs in commons lang and we fixed bugs in spring spring match um, so it, that sort of gives you an idea of just how useful this functionality is and as users are reporting issues then we are contacting um, the appropriate folks for those third-party libraries and trying to get them to fix their issues as well and so far it's going you know, very well next up is alias support this is a often requested feature in Tomcat 6, and what it lets you do is map either a WAR file or a directory into a particular URL in your web application. Now, all of this only applies to static content, so you can't take an entire WAR file with a web.xml and expect it to work. It will just get treated as static content. So it's ideal for things like directories with images or CSS or something like that. And what the way you set it up is with the aliases attributes on the context, and it's just a common separated list of alias path to docbase. So if docbase one in this example was a directory and alias path was as shown there, slash alias path one and your web app was deployed to the my app context, then whatever content was in the directory doc base one, that would then be available at slash my web app slash alias path one. And you can do that, you can have as many of those um, aliases as you like. So it's useful if you want to provide common content to multiple web applications. Uh, it also can be used when embedding if you want to provide alternative paths to things like the WebInf lib directory or WebInf classes.